Welcome to Crit Hit Interviews. I'm Arlian, and I'm joined today by Shrimp. Hey. And Lovey. Hello. As well as Alexander Kuzmonovic from Alexander Kuzmonovic Games. I think I got your last name right. Close enough. <laughs> Hello. I mean, <laughs> you, you can always say it so we can actually get it right. If you'd like to, it's just an it's an ch at the end. Like I thought itch. as much. <laughs> but I don't really care. Kuzmonovic. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. He's the creator of Gunlock, and he's also working on a new game called Unworthy. So, out of the games that you've been playing recently, uh, which would you say you've been enjoying the most? I, I don't want to go like with the... It's probably like going to be the obvious choice for me, at least, but definitely Dark Souls and Bloodborne, but I feel like it's the only game I play lately, so it might be a bit of an unfair bias there. I mean, fair enough. But yeah, not, not a very interesting answer, but yeah, that's pretty much it for me. It's fair. They're pretty replayable. Well, yeah, I mean, also, like, uh, I don't know. Those are the games that stuck the most with me. Like, I'm such a diehard fan of the lore and just, like, the way the world building is done. And I feel like I just go over again just to kind of, like, explore every nook and cranny and sort of just, I don't know. I really appreciate the way it's all put together. And I feel like no asset is wasted in those games. What what Dark Souls is to you, Sultan Sanctuary is to me. (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) Okay, so you've mentioned that Gunlock was made in two weeks which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and you said that you learn things from having a fully released Steam game that will help improve Unworthy. So yep. well, would you say a smaller project like that, is, well, I mean, would you recommend a smaller project like that to other devs? And should it be done before their big game idea starts or after it's worked on it for a while, similar to how you've done? Um, I think it's, t- it's a tough question to answer. I think there's merits to like aiming big off the bat that you don't get if you kind of try and play it safe, I guess. But then at the same time, like starting off something smaller, there's some value to be gained there as well. I think if you're able to like find the passion for a small project that is really something you would probably never like play on your own, uh, like a game you'd want to purchase and play, it's great and you should probably make those kinds of games in the beginning because you'll learn a lot more and like every time you finish a smaller project like when it's actually completed you it's kind of like leveling up you you really don't level up as much if you're just working on a project but never release it and complete it i don't know if that makes complete sense but the the, the difficult part i think with making the smaller games is often like even you guys as players uh, and myself I, I don't go in and fantasize about like super small games like you, you like salt and sanctuary which is a huge like piece of work for, for an indie team i like dark souls which i don't, I, don't, I can't fathom an indie team actually putting together something like that and these are the kind of games we want to play in, in in the same right it's probably the same kind of games we want to make which is very tricky to start with um a game of that scope i would say so sorry that was a bit of a mixed like tangent but basically i, I would recommend working on smaller games if you can find the passion for it but if you're into trying to have something big, there's no harm in like, if you have the time and resources, there's no harm in trying to make something big and then kind of like cutting it off because you, you still would have learned a lot from that. And odds are you'd probably be working a lot harder on a game like that than you would be on something that's smaller and constrained because of restrictions you put on yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds logical. <laughs> sounds like it might make sense. <laughs> well then, what has been your favorite memory of watching someone play any of your games or demos? I'm probably going to sound like a bit of a sadist here or something, but like to me, I think the, the most favorable thing that I see is when, I, when I've seen people who've played the Unworthy demos like actually get uh, destroyed by some of the enemies that I've put in there. Um, it, I, I, and I'm not like a complete sadist with it. It's just like when I see them and they actually get that kind of bit of, it, it's like this enjoyable frustration. It's not like the people who, where you like throw a computer, where you throw like a controller at your screen, but just kind of like, oh, I need to go back and do this. And then follow it up by that actual like triumphant, oh man, like, you know, wiping the sweat off yourself after you actually, <laughs> uh, after you actually succeed in, uh, killing the boss or the enemy. Like to me, that's one of the most enjoyable things I, I see because I see that like the player also gets this enjoyment out of it. And I'm also a firm believer that like, at least with, with design, you, you can never get the same enjoyment or the same type of enjoyment out of a game that doesn't challenge you, or at least at some point make you feel a little bit crummy because you, you, you need that roller coaster ride. Like you need to compare that low to the high in order to really get the full breadth of the spectrum. 
whereas something that's like more safe and like casual like i'm sure you can you know play it put hours in it and kind of like enjoy it casually but you don't get that like adrenaline rush and that real like sense of satisfaction i think the, the whole adversity makes it better yeah <laughs> fair fair on that subject you've mentioned that you're going to continue making updates to gunlock and it's like a smaller game but it's a pretty tough little cookie is there anything in particular you'd like to see added to it gunlock specifically one thing i wanted to add that somebody put in as a suggestion i think it'd be cool for this very small like diehard community that's there with the leaderboards is like a restricted leaderboard system where everybody has to kind of use the same guns or weapons and compete against it it'd be just because it's something like i feel like i would like because i'm not gonna spend the time thinking about how somebody like put together this you know crazy awesome build or exploiting some gun that works better here or whatever but it'll be literally like you know exactly same setup and it's like who's actually better with their like twitch reflexes fair enough that's it i don't think there's too much to say about um like it's a very small game so i don't think there's too much to say about like adding any crazy large things to it it's just you know yeah so before we get into the questions about unworthy is there anything you would like to say to those who haven't been following its development uh metroidvania as far as i know it's probably i I think the first one that i i can think of that actually legitimately takes jumping out of the equation which i I don't think is any small feat given how um, dependent metroidvanias are on vertical traversal of levels because you know on a 2d plane if you're only going left and right it's it's just a long line but if you're going you need the vertical plane in order to actually do the world building. And I think it'll be something that's going to be unique and very different to than to what like a lot of players are accustomed to. And I'm sure it might throw some off at the beginning, but like I think it's a, it should be a refreshing and interesting experience, especially with like how combat-centric it is. And I think it's probably, in, in my opinion, the closest thing to like the 2D Dark Souls experience that you can get. <laughs> Is there anything that won't make it into Unworthy that you really wanted? Just thinking that there isn't anything that's not going to make it. There's some things that I feel weren't as fleshed out as I would have liked them to have been. And I think that's just because like, as the game grows, certain design decisions start competing with other design decisions. And together, they just can't work. One thing I wanted to put into it was, and it is in it, is like this day-night cycle that's dependent on your local time. Hmm. And, and it's it's in it i just would have liked it to be more fleshed out and like put in with like you know some enemies that are coming in at a certain uh, time of day or uh, other ones that are at a different time of day just to kind of like help build that world building thing and it's just due to due to the constraints of i think the way the combat is designed it, it makes it difficult to make like way too many enemies because again most of them have to be like anchored down to like the ground so there are some that are flying but those it's 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 actually quite challenging to design enemies around like the idea that the player can't jump and still make it fair. Did the flying ones just sort of do the hover thing? Yeah, they just sort of do the hover thing and end up being like like archers or, or like functioning as archers from range and you kind of have to use your bow to pick at them or sort of place yourself and trick them into kind of like going on an area where you're on higher ground. But without, like there's only so much so much you can do with it and if you start putting more of them that look different, it's just going to feel like I think a reskin, which I would say is like adding content just for the sake of adding content isn't probably the best game design decision. Like it, it has to be well thought out and yeah. play a role. Cause um, you know, it's, it's like the movie was as well. Like if you, sometimes you'll go in and you'll enjoy a movie that's at an hour and a half and you know, you spent the same amount of money on it as a movie that's like two and a half hours, but the two and a half hours you you walk there, you're like, man, that could have been condensed to like an hour and a half and, and it just ruins the experience as opposed to, you know, they could have spent less time making it and it would have been a better film. Yep. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so so yeah back to answer that question just like i wish i'd fleshed out the day night cycle a little bit more uh there's a few things that are like dependent on it that are optional like quest things which is kind of like hinted with like riddles and stuff in in the game so like certain things you you have to do at a certain time on your machine that's if you want to like finish the whole story i don't I'm, I'm curious to see how it'll play out and if anybody's gonna be frustrated with it being like oh i don't want to like it's an inconvenient time for me to play or whatever but uh, just change your your clock yeah i think computer. so i think some like, people won't know <laughs> won't know that <laughs> like okay sns brothers uh the swords and sorcery thing uh-huh. how do you similar system certain stuff in the game required certain times for like stuff in okay it. so you, you either 
did a horribly crappy thing to change your time, or you actually, you know, just played at those certain times, or you just changed your clock on your <laughs> computer. Yeah, I used I to do that back in, like, the Game Boy days. Uh, you could, because some games also relied on real life time, and you'd just be like, oh, okay, time to fiddle with this. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely remember doing that for Boktai. Oh, also Fable. Fable, um, setting the date to, like, the earliest you could set it, getting into the game, saving, and then advancing the game by 100 years because you gained, like, experience and money over time, like, at a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just like, ah, oh, this would be hypothetically the amount of experience I would have earned after 100 years. <laughs> it's, less, it's less impressive than I would have thought, but oh well, I'll accept it. <laughs> super sleazy game hacks <laughs> yep. but so what are some of the themes players can expect to see in unworthy and when you say themes you mean like legitimately like story themes and thematic structure like that right yeah basically uh, well just to like put it out there so that nobody gets the wrong impression and thinks that it's like you know some crazy point and click story adventure thing it's mostly centered around like player experience of combat and in stabbing and people. stabbing stuff and like you know having a good old time and exploring and things so, so it's very much in like the vein of you know the dark Souls stuff like you don't actually have to pay attention to the story at all if you don't want to but there's a whole like deep world there for you to explore if you'd like to uh, so that's kind of how it's structured but it's supposed to touch in some ways on like the theme of death and, and life as well but not like this whole you know like what it, like dying living kind of thing but like in the idea of through certain eyes, could it be possible that life is a, a darker sentence than death itself, I suppose? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it's structured. I don't want to sound like super morbid about it. It's more like supposed to be uplifting about like getting more appreciation for life. But the idea of like, it's supposed to touch on thematically that like life is only a blessing if you actually mold it and structure it in a way that it is. It's very easy to turn life into something that's worse, worse than death itself if if. And, and that's not maybe just for you, but I mean, like, for others as well. So that's kind of, like, some of the themes that it touches on. On that note, what were your thematic inspirations? Thematic inspirations? Yeah, literature, games, anything, really. Y yeah, I know. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, what is it specifically about literature? Honestly, it's going to sound maybe, like, uh, stupid. A lot of it is from just thinking about my own experiences in life, and I kind of just took very simple experiences, small ones, and kind of like cranked up the dial to multiply it by 100, I guess. And so like for me, it was just like going through life and school and seeing, and I probably like overanalyzed things, but seeing like how other people felt about themselves and others around them, including like something as simple as, you know, doing a job that you don't want to do or like doing a job you want to do, but somebody at work making this an unpleasant experience because they have completely like different goals and they don't care about it because they're so like stuck in their own world that it's like, as long as they get ahead, everything's fine. But then like this might, and it's just like through people I've met as well, like these things kind of trickle down to not just like then influencing that person's life, but they come home or like talk to somebody else. And this like darker route seems to like get into other people's lives as well. And it sort of tends to, spread and it all came down to at some point like came from a single person who thought that you know as long as my life is better who cares how the other person's life is and it's not like just the immediate person that they influence but like it kind of spread through everything and this isn't as bad as like you know this whole life death thing but it, it, it's the idea of that like with enough decisions like this if you let it go for you know, years and years on end, eventually it's going to grow into something where, like, t like t take the American situation, for example, you know, like when Trump gets elected, I guess, and I'm not like a political guy, but like as soon as he did, the like whole world flipped upside down. And this is like mm. arguably because of, this didn't happen like in one day, this is arguably the development of a thought process and culture and decisions that have like been stewing for hundreds of years, right? So it's kind of, the, that's kind of like what, got me thinking about this kind of stuff, I guess. And just noticing that things that we kind of turn a blind eye to and think like, oh, it's not such a big deal if somebody like, you know, was unpleasant to somebody here or something went this way. It's like over time, this becomes an accustomed norm and it eventually propagates into something else. And this is kind of like what's set the stage, I think, for the world and Unworthy as well, where it's not like something that manifested itself. It's not like you're thrown into this crappy world. It was like you're there, but this is something that wasn't like this 200 years ago or some amount of time ago. 
cool. It's always good to have like um, a more personal inspiration for your games like that. So yeah, I think it needs to be to some extent personal, just because otherwise you're probably going to be making something that you know hundreds of other people could have made. Like you know, a lot of people have read Lord of the Rings, and if that's like you know my thematic inspiration, I'm sure it's going to end up looking similar to a lot of other games. And although I'm sure it's going to look have some similarities to other games, there is certainly an element of it that's going to be personal, and I would hope it'll help it like differentiate itself from other games. So what are your favorites among the enemies you've created? So far, uh, well, I can't disclose which one it is. My, my favorite, I think, so far is the, the third boss. I can't disclose who or what it is. <laughs> I don't want to, I guess. I can, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> and that's pr- probably so far uh, my favorite. I, I, I've, I've lurked on your social media a little bit so i have to wonder if it's one of the ones you've already showcased or if it's actually no i have i've I've made a very strong like effort to not show any of the bosses except for the two that are in the demo Mm -hmm. keeping that that precious favorite to yourself and so we can be surprised by it huh yeah well it's it's cool I i think it's really cool there's like some mechanics in there that i haven't seen like in other games and it was one of those things where i think um like the restriction I put on myself with the game design helped like come up with something that I think was like really cool and innovative and uh, feels pretty good and just it's like neat. I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of excited about it. <laughs> Is your favorite enemy amongst the ones you've created? Does that differ from your favorite one to animate, or are they the same? It's it's definitely going to be different, just because I think the an- animation was something that I enjoyed a lot more in the beginning and. In the beginning, I would say those animations are probably a little bit. I don't want to say like they're they're not bad, but like a little bit worse than the ones that are coming up later in the game, just because you know through experience you you get better at things. But at the same time, I was having a lot more of a blast when I knew less about animation because it was kind of like this process of self discovery, trying to figure out like what works well and trying to come up with creative ways to like animate things better and save time here and make it look cooler and stuff like that. Whereas now I've kind of got like this developed toolkit so it's it's more of like a rinse and repeat the same process over and over again which is not as fun i guess yeah fair enough so by that logic i would say that the enemies that i was doing earlier in the game were the ones that were more pleasant to to animate and uh more interesting to animate than the ones i'm doing now i'll admit i really dug the uh the archer oh yeah <laughs> the, the one where he uh, <laughs> with the gunning down the demon thing like yeah, just the, like, complete murder storm of arrows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I like, I don't know, I'm a big fan of the, like, Japanese, I guess, style of, like, setting things up where, you know, it's, like, these power levels that are, don't make any sense. Like, you know, people blowing up planets like Dragon Ball Z <laughs> and things. I feel just, like, <laughs> kind of, it, it makes this seem like, oh, this is really serious. But at the same time, you're like, you know, come on, this is, this is going to be a joke, too. So, this is ridiculous, yeah. but awesome all the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's kind of like that was a, my little stab at something like that, and I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. So <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it too. So, what has been your favorite content in general added to Unworthy? Probably one of my the single favorite thing that I have in the game is uh, this like hammer weapon that's in there, and it's not just because like you know. I'm, like a huge fan of Warhammers or something. It's just the way it, it, it interacts with enemies is for, and also the environment and world, I think, is probably the most like dynamic and influential weapon in the game because uh, it, it does like so many things. It, it'll like, you know, breaks shields of enemies. It influences these like weirdly buoyant uh, platforms. And basically, like, when you hit it with a hammer, it like pushes it down and it starts to like oscillate in the air. And um, you can, like, use this as a means of, like, vertical traversal, as well as there's some, like, pretty cool... I I think they're pretty cool, like, uh, puzzles in in the game as well, using this mechanism. And I'm also trying very much, like, I'm speaking on tangent here a bit, but, like, trying to not make puzzles overly complicated uh, in the game and not, like, make them way too time-consuming. They're just, like, these, like, little simple aha moments because I think that the game is probably geared to a player base that isn't as interested in um, like some overly complex puzzles where you have to like you know spend 30 minutes thinking about how to like 
put all your things together. So finally this one door opens. I mean, I'm effectively like designing a game for somebody who's like me and that's never been an interest of mine. So yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So complicated enough to that you have to think about it for a bit, but not so complicated that you'll just look it up. Yeah, I, yeah. That you need to like look up something to decipher Morse code so you can parse that together to go to a certain coordinate and sit there for like 30 seconds. Yeah. I, I mean, in effect, they're as much as a puzzle, I would say, as like somebody who, if you can put them like in a vacuum where they'd never played Super Mario or some platformer and you have to like jump over a hole. You, you know, like it, it's not, it's not a puzzle by any means, but the first time when you don't like, if you can imagine playing a game where you never played a platform, if you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's how that mechanic works, and that's a way I can interact with the world. So, like when I say something like this hammer thing, it's you get introduced that you can like push these platforms down, and then all of a sudden there might be like one other element thrown in there, and you're like, oh, okay, like I get it. If I use this in conjunction with this, I can do this. So it's like a one-off like learning with two different things. Thing. It's not like here here's a three-digit number that you have to have to solve and Next time, it's a four-digit number. You know, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's like mechanics. Yeah, or in like teaching the mechanics yeah. in a sort of puzzly way. Okay. Okay. So, will and worthy be a standalone title, or can we expect a sequel at some point? Uh, that's a good question. Presently, I, I, I'm not sure what to say to it. Like, I wouldn't be opposed to doing a sequel. I think it would be interesting to build on the story more. The only thing is, like, once it launches, obviously. Yeah, you know, the, the success of the game is going to determine that a lot. Like, if it's something that gets zero interest, there's really no point in, like, putting a sequel to it, in my opinion. I mean, I'd like to work on it, but you can't really make a martyr of yourself, right? Yeah, so, fair enough. So, I mean, if if it's received well enough, I would not be opposed to doing a sequel. I probably would. I'd probably do it a little bit differently. You know, I call it, like, worthy, and now you can jump. Uh, so. <laughs> I was about to ask, like, what would be the naming scheme? So. Unworthier? Uh. Yeah, I, I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd do something with it if it uh, was received well enough that it makes sense to, to do it, you know? So, you mentioned that there's, like, no jumping on in unworthy as sort of method to help make sure enemies aren't just something players jump over and ignore without turning things into a bullet hell. Yep. Will we see more variations of limiting players in coaxing them into working within the constraints of the systems in future titles from you? I, I would, if I'm working on action games, I would hope so. And I, and I would like to do that kind of stuff. I, I feel in, in my opinion, uh, there's this trend nowadays very often with like games where, and I think I've also been tempted to design uh, in that way a couple of times, even throughout the development of Unworthy, where you just add more features and things that you can do just for the sake of saying, you know, like you can you can do it. And then it's like, if I have more, there's more for the player to do. So they're less likely to get bored and there's more like, and it seems to, at least I've kind of feel like I've noticed this kind of philosophy, which I it's something I really feel doesn't work and i think sometimes taking things away and making a very like cohesive structured system around the little that you have ends up creating a better experience and with that regard i think that kind of feeds into that decision so i'd i'd like to do something like that in the future i think i, I think it also helps a lot with conveyance because like for example taking away jumping in unworthy you kind of like go on the first screen and you kind of roll around a bit and you know, try out your attacks and do things like that. And you immediately, you're like, okay, so I get to move like left and right. I get to roll. And then you're throwing up a few things in like a safe environment or thrown at you to figure out what else you can do with that roll and kind of how it works. And if immediately like, okay, like I, I know everything I need to get through like 95% of this game. And then like later you get introduced a few like other tiny mechanics that really just like contribute to very sp specific situations. But your hopes of being part of a basketball team have been dashed with your inability to join. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So you mentioned that any idea you felt added a lot to the game would be added to Unworthy. Does that mean that you'll be leaning away from DLC? No, I'm not leaning away from D DLC. I've already, like, throughout the development, I've thought about things that I would... Just to put it out there, like, if it was DLC, it would be, like free DLC, not like paid, because I think like in order to do paid DLC, you need to get a very substantial amount of work in there. Um, whereas I think something like the way Hollow Knight has been done recently, I think that's 
a much better like way to go about it. Like you kind of give something back to the players, but you don't you, you don't you don't make a whole other game to, to like add on to it. You, you know what I mean? Like you'll maybe add like a boss or two, and that's enough to kind of like give a bit of dessert to the players, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, to answer that question, I wouldn't be against DLC. It would be free DLC, and again though, it would be it, it would need to be like again justified like if the game flopped completely to the point that nobody's playing it for a game like unworthy i probably wouldn't do any dlc just because you know it'd probably take like a month of or two of full-time work to develop it and it's just like you know it, it, it's it's life essence i i guess it's like if, if it doesn't pay the bills you can't really justify doing it fair enough sorry i'm sorry i have to be a suit for a minute <laughs> no no it's it's it, you, you need to eat starving <laughs> artists are not as chic as they're shown in media. <laughs> Stares at you. It's fine. Uh huh. I eat once a day. Uh huh. <laughs> exactly. So you said that you kind of started too big with game development and started with an MMO, and then you decided to work on Runic Legacy of Sin, but that turned out to be a bit of a long project as well. But my question is can we still expect to see Runic maybe sometime after Unworthy is done? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, like, I have a lot of, like, plans about how I'm going to approach future projects, depending, again, on the success of this project. And it's basically, like, Runic is really the game, I think, I, in my heart, I really, like, want to make. Uh, not to say I, I did, didn't want to make Unworthy, but, like, this is, that's, like, the, like, ultimate goal project. I feel like that would be... You know, after I'm done that, I can kick the bucket. But <laughs> the the <laughs> thing is, it, it's just something that I would like to do. But I, I need obviously the resources, the I guess for lack of a better term, like safety to actually embark on uh, working on a project that I think is that large. Um, so it's definitely the game I want to make. It's still there. It's just uh, I can't answer whether it's going to happen or not. It, it really depends on a lot of like factors in, in life that are yet to be revealed to me. <laughs> Fair enough. And maybe when Worthy is really successful, you could expand that art team and then have it released faster than you thought it would be. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I definitely would want to, um, just because, once again, that was the naive thing of going, starting with a game of that size, is that you, you know, like I made one sprite, and I was like, you know, that's not so bad. Like, that didn't take me that long. That took me like a, you know, day to, like, make this character and, like, animate, like, one attack and it looks pretty sweet. Like, you know, if I do this, it's gonna have, like, a full move set in seven days. And it's crazy because, like, you, you, you don't get the experience of knowing that it's like that relationship where you walked into it on day one and, like, you know, everything's going full force and you're the most productive and everything's awesome and you're loving it. And then, like, three three months later, all of a sudden, your productivity is low. You're getting these days where you just don't feel like working on it. And there's a lot to be said for that. I don't think... Uh, like, there's a lot of people that say, you know, like, inspiration uh, is not as important as discipline. And I think that's true. But, like, in this particular uh, field, if you don't have inspiration, it's it's very difficult to to produce because, like, it's it's a creative field, right? So you, you, you need... and You can't be disciplined to be creative, like... I don't think you can. I think you need that inspiration in order to to move forward. Hmm. And I think uh, getting like a bigger art team to like do these things uh, is something that would help because that way, if you're producing quicker and you see results quicker, it also helps you stay motivated. It's those like lull days when you spent like seven days doing one thing, and at the end of the day, this might like translate to five minutes of a player's experience. That's a little bit like demoralizing, and it's something that happens all the time. <laughs> okay. First off, I'd really like to thank you for just taking the time to come on the show today and answer our questions. Uh, for those in the audience, you can buy Gunlock on Steam, with Unworthy being soon to follow and currently wishlistable. And be sure to follow at Mr. Amless on Twitter and Unworthy Game on Facebook to keep up with all his latest news. Uh, is there anything else that you'd... or rather anywhere else that you would like to direct people to? Um... No, I mean, uh, I try to be active on all the f like areas where you know people who are interested in my work might be following. There's also like a Reddit for it. It's occasionally other people posting, but mostly me like posting updates every now and then. So yeah, I mean, if yeah, that's probably it. Like Reddit, Steam, Facebook, and Twitter are kind of like the areas where you can kind of see the work. Cool beans. Yeah. 
Yeah, and seriously, it was a pleasure having you on the show. No, and uh, it was a pleasure being noticed and invited by you guys. Uh, definitely appreciate it, and thank you so much for you know, inviting me to this interview. <laughs> it's always a nice feeling like somebody likes your work. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I was sort of amazed that you were in the same city as me. Like, that was a serendipitous meeting. <laughs> yeah. Like, just like randomly like, oh. I mean, that looks sort of familiar. It's like, I have this wish listed on Steam. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool. I mean, yeah, man, the world's a lot smaller than than, uh, than you think. I, I, I keep like being reminded all the time. Also, for those currently watching, if you would like to be part of a Discord that is devoted to indie gaming and indie devs and also tabletop nerdery, you can follow the Discord link in the description below. And if you are interested in seeing more developer interviews and other gaming related quality content like comment and subscribe to the channel and you know share it to people who you think might also be interested thanks for tuning in